Um, Today my talk is about Polygon uh, well, Maiden VM, which is uh, the, roll, uh, the VM around which we're building Polygon Maiden rollup. And um, just what is exactly Polygon Maiden? Uh, it's a general purpose Stark-based rollup, uh, ZK, uh, ZK rollup. And since this is day two and this is a ZK track, I'm not gonna explain what a ZK rollup is. And I also am not gonna talk about what a Stark-based is. It basically just means we're using Starks as an underlying proving system. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, what is general purpose. So uh, ZK rollups in general can be classified into two categories. You can have specialized uh, rollups, which handle specific use cases, for example, payments, exchange, or you know, NFTs. And, uh, or you can have a general purpose rollup, uh, which uh, allows you to uh, write arbitrary smart contracts. And this is something that you know, all of us are much more excited about, where this is uh, what the flexibility that you get with Ethereum overall, where you can write your own smart contract and uh, have basically arbitrary logic being executed. Um, for general purpose ZK rollups, you need a zero knowledge virtual machine. This is something that will execute your programs. Um, Let's talk about what is a ZK virtual machine. So first, this is kind of like a regular virtual machine, and this is a very like simplified diagram, I guess, but basically what a virtual machine does, it uh, takes some initial state, uh, applies some programs, executes some programs against this initial state, and you get some final state at the end. Um, with a ZK virtual machine, we get a few more blocks in here. So first block is that you get also a proof at the end. And this proof is, proves that the programs were applied correctly, executed correctly, and if you apply the programs to the initial state, you'll get the final state. And the nice thing about this proof is that the proof is fast to verify. So uh, in fact, it should be exponentially faster to verify the proof than to run the programs themselves. The other thing that you get with um, ZK Virtual Machine is ability to provide this witness data, which is kind of like secret inputs. Um, and one way to think about this is that, uh, for example, in a context of transactions, you have to verify signatures. But uh, signatures could be provided as a witness data, and witness data does not need to be um, known to the verifier, the, only the prover needs to know that, so the signatures could be excluded from uh, kind of some, the data that the verifier needs to know to, uh, uh, to verify the correctness of the exec execution. So you kind of can provide the signatures as a witness data, and then you know, they kind of disappear after that. Um, now, now that we know we want to build some kind of uh, ZKVM, what kind of ZKVM should we build? That's, uh, I guess, one of the questions. And one of the things is that you could build something you know, using a mainstream architecture like WebAssembly or RISC-V or something like that. Um, the other approach is you can build something EVM equivalent, basically something that can execute EVM bytecode at the binary level. And then the other approach is to do something new where you have a new instruction set, and this instruction set could be ZK-optimized. And there are a few properties that we care about, like while we think about these types of uh, you know, approaches to zero knowledge virtual machines, like uh, there are pros and cons and different properties that they have. So first one is uh, you know, existing expertise and tooling. Like do people know about these architectures? And if we talk about like general mainstream, uh, like web assemblies and RISC-Vs that you have a bunch of tooling out there, used in mainstream that you compile like C, Rust, and other programs into this, there is a bunch of you know, both tooling expertise. If we talk about EVM equivalent uh, uh, bytecode, there is, you know, EVM is the standard in the, in the blockchain space, and people um, kind of, there is quite a bit of expertise there, still not as much as compared to like mainstream, but there is quite a bit of expertise already available and a lot of tooling developed around uh, EVM specifically. And then if you're building something new, obviously there is not much expertise or um, uh, uh, tooling around that. So the next thing, if we talk about this, is it blockchain specific? Like we care about this in the context of blockchains and um, you know, there are special properties that we want to like certain things that we want to care for in, in a blockchain context. And if you think about like the mainstream approaches, they're not really optimized for ZK. I mean, you can adapt them, but it, it usually like requires you to build things around uh, kind of like that, uh, uh, you know, make it appropriate to use in blockchains. And then at that point in time, you kind of like, you know, moving away from a mainstream and kind of like specialize it a lot. Um, EVM was obviously built uh, with blockchains in mind, so it is a uh, blockchain-focused uh, kind of environment. And then if you're building your own new instruction set architecture, you can customize it to whatever you want, so you could build, make it blockchain-appropriate or blockchain-focused. And then the next thing is uh, kind of performance, is uh, you know, if you have a mainstream um, uh, kind of architecture, it may be relatively performant depending on what you choose. For example, if you choose RISC-V, 32-bit uh, instruction set, and like limited to like integers only, it could be fairly performant. 
Um, but if you choose something else, it might not be as performant. If you choose uh, EVM equivalents, unfortunately, EVM was not designed to be very easy KPV friendly, so you don't get, like, you can build it, but it will be more challenging from a perf performance standpoint, and you might need to throw more uh, hardware at it to uh, generate more quickly. And then if you're choosing your instruction set to be optimized for ZKP, this is the, where you get the flexibility to make it more uh, kind of performant on that front. All right. Um, so let's talk about this EVM equivalent. And uh, you know, there is another way to, uh, to think about this uh, Ethereum compatibility. So like on the left, like the, the highest level of equivalence you can get is by having this binary compatibility where you can execute uh, basically bytecode. Uh, yeah, EVM bytecode, and that is uh, that is very attractive because your contracts just work as is. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to migrate anything. Everything kind of works out of the box. There are um, other approaches where you kind of try to be more. Um, you don't have this binary compatibility, but you still are able to execute um, kind of uh, let's say contracts compiled from Solidity. So you don't have this. Uh, at the bytecode level, but you have the compatibility of this at Solidity level. And even there, you can be on the spectrum of different kind of like how close you want to be to the EVM. Um, and you can have a different instruction, like a different VM that uh, is very tailored to EVM execution, or you can have something more general with a different instruction set where you can still execute um, kind of EVM compatible code, but you may not be as efficient in some of the, like it's not optimized necessarily to be super efficient with EVM specific stuff. Um, Let's talk about like this. You know, why would you want to do this? And non, uh, besides performance, actually, well, performance is the first one listed here. But uh, one of the, you know, let's go through the pros and cons of this uh, being non-equivalent to EVM. So I already mentioned the performance. One of the reasons for that is like EVM has a lot of design choices. For example, using 32 bytes and uh, you know having. Um, let's say specific hash functions that are not very efficient within the uh, uh, ZKP context. Another thing that you get if you don't try to be necessarily 100% adherent to EVM is that uh, a set of advanced features that you can deploy. Like I think there is, uh, there was a gr great question early in, a, in one of the talks where you know there's a tension between trying to adhere to the standards and innov innov innovating. So you know uh, with this you have the flexibility. If you if you don't try to adhere 100% to the standards, you have more flexibility on the innovation. So you can build in new features that. You know, some people might care about. So account abstractions is one example. If you care post about post-quantum cryptography, that may be another thing. So you can uh, kind of innovate more easily in a new uh, kind of architecture context. Um, the other benefit is safety. So uh, within EDM, there are a few things that, you know, ideally are not as safe or, you know, would, we would like to have removed, but it's probably too late to remove them at this point in time. So one of those features are like dynamic function calls where you don't know the uh, f uh, call targets uh, statically. So you can disable them if you're building a new architecture. And then uh, the last one is, you know, EVM also not necessarily built for privacy. So maybe if you're building something new, you can from the ground up design something that is more appropriate for in a privacy standpoint where you can preserve, you know, either have private transactions or even privacy preserving smart contracts. And so what are the drawbacks? So like if the, the benefits are fairly clear, but the drawbacks are fairly clear as well. So compatibility is a big one because if you're not adhering to uh, EVM 100%, uh, then there are some migration challenges. So, you know, as an example, if you don't have binary compatibility, inline assembly may not work and you need to do some special processing to make sure it works. Uh, some EVM built-ins may not work and, you know, gas model may be different and some smart contracts optimize very heavily for specific, you know, gas consumption and so forth. So those things need to be taken into account when you migrate to uh, your contract to a system that is not EVM equivalent. And then, um, as I already mentioned, that the tooling may not be there, so you need, might need to build out a new set of tools uh, or at least adapt existing tools to make sure that uh, you know, developers have a nice experience developing against your architecture. Okay, so this kind of uh, highlights the overall differences and like, uh, you know, once you're building a ZKVM, like, this is, uh, these are the options and um, these are the pros and cons, but um, now let's talk about a little bit Polygon Maiden and what uh, choices did we make in the VM specifically. So, Polygon Maiden VM is a uh, Turing Complete ZK Optimized Ethereum Compatible Virtual Machine. So, uh, it's a mouthful of different terms. So, Turing Complete means you can do any kind of logic, uh, you can execute any uh, smart contract, 
ZK optimized means that we've chosen uh, a route where we're not going to be 100% like bytecode compatible with EVM, but we will try to kind of optimize for ZK uh, for the performance a bit more. And Ethereum compatible means we are trying to uh, get to a point where we're compatible with Ethereum at Solidity level. So you can compile Solidity, maybe with some minor kind of migrations here and there, uh, but a uh, vast majority of uh, uh, smart contracts written in Solidity would work uh, what's compiled to Maiden VM uh, internal representation. Um, and uh, when we kind of design, and as we're building Mind and Me, and we have few goals in mind, that's kind of our target for why we're, or reasons why we made some of the decisions that we made. So the first one is this safe programmability. Uh, we want to prevent unsafe programs uh, as much as possible at the VM level. So the idea is that uh, you know, we'll disable some of the features that uh, allow, as I mentioned, for example, dynamic uh, jumps uh, within the program. Um, the other thing is that we do want to support this advanced functionality where there are some new features that are not like account abstractions is one, uh, one very interesting feature that we're uh, interested in, in supporting even though EVM doesn't support it yet. Um, and then uh, there's language flexibility. I mentioned this uh, Solidity as one you know, primary use case or uh, like it's uh, first class citizen within the Maiden VM. But we do also want to support other blockchain-focused languages. There is a few languages being developed out there. Um, just to throw out a few examples, Move that was developed by Facebook Novi or um, you know, Sway language by Few Labs. Uh, they all look very interesting, and we hope to support you know, multiple uh, languages uh, being compiled to Maiden VM. And then uh, this is more kind of a future goal, uh, like immediate focuses on scalability, but we do want to lay the groundwork and build the foundation in such a way that you can move to privacy more easily in the future, uh, that the structure is set up in such a way where, you know, even the foundational blocks are, in, uh, in, uh, arranged, in such, uh, arranged so that it's not going to hinder our ability to uh, move to, like, privacy-preserving smart contracts in the future. All right. Um, so at the high level, Maiden VM has two components. There is a prover and the verifier, and they have their respective tasks of either generating proof for executing programs and then uh, you know, verifying those proofs. Um, one of the important things for the prover is performance targets, and this is kind of our target goal, like goal performance. It's, don't take them as concrete yet. We're still working on those. But uh, you know, just to give you a, a snapshot of how fast the VM is, and this includes both executing the program and uh, generating a start proof for it, so, you know, 25,000 instructions per second on a single core. Uh, generating ZK proofs is highly parallelizable, so if you go to, um, you know, more cores or GPUs and FPGAs, you can actually achieve uh, quite a, a significant speed up. Um, the other important part is on the verifier side, so, uh, you know, proof sizes uh, are fairly large. Anytime you go with a transparent system that doesn't require trusted setup, you're going to be in uh, kilobytes and probably dozens of kilobytes. In our case, depending on the parameter choices, you can be somewhere between 60 and 100 kilobytes for the proofs. The proofs themselves are extremely fast to verify, regardless of how, um, how complex the original computation was, it's going to be somewhere in the three to five millisecond range to verify the proofs. But because they are large, the cost of verifying them on Ethereum is fairly high. So uh, we estimate that right now it's going to be between three and five million gas. But hopefully with some EIPs that are currently in progress, this is going to be reduced significantly because if the call data becomes cheaper, the, this is where the bulk of the cost for uh, Stark proofs come in. Uh, you can reduce it quite a bit. And um, the way we execute programs on Maiden VM is uh, there is a like user-facing Maiden assembly language. Um, it's an assembly language that gets uh, compiled by the assembler into something that we call program mast or Merkleized abstract syntax tree. This is one of the unique features of the VM that I'll explain like a few slides down the road. But then this mast gets fed into the actual Maiden VM and gets executed. So this is kind of like you write programs in Maiden assembly and then you know, it gets transpiled by the assembler and then you get, and can execute them. And then when I was talking about higher level languages like uh, Solidity and others, the idea is that uh, they will get compiled into Maiden assembly and then Maiden assembly uh, kind of like uh, takes it from there. Um, just to highlight a few features of the VM. So the first one is it's a regular stack based VM. Uh, it's a push down stack and the base data type of the VM is a 32 bit integer. So you don't need to deal with um, you know, field elements or anything else. So we try to abstract as much cryptography as possible. So it's just basic, uh, basically a 32 bit machine. Uh, and stack is practically unlimited, and uh, you know there is instructions to access the first you know top 16 items of the stack. Um, 
because of this like must thing that I described earlier, we also uh, don't expose like control flow logic very uh, kind of like in a detailed way. So you, there are no jump or go to instructions. And that also prevents the dynamic uh, kind of, um, you know, function calls, uh, you, all the call targets are statically known. But so uh, to allow you this mm, kind of like, you know, control your like write interesting programs, we do have like high level const constructs for control flow, such as if the nail statements, loops of various types and so forth. Um, the other thing is that we have random access memory and it's a full read write memory. Um, the, the way we have it is it's, the memory is word addressable in the context of mind and VM, a word is four uh, elements uh, or 432 bit values or 128 bits and you can, VM can read and write in batches of four or a single element at a time as well. Um, we do have procedures, it's kind of like you can think about them as functions where you can have procedures with their locals and that way it's fairly close uh, to how, let's say, a WebAssembly does uh, function calls where you have procedures and you can declare a number of locals that uh, are going to be used by the procedure uh, and this is like a basic way to encapsulate code within Mind and VM. And then the last kind of like feature to highlight here is this uh, Mind and Standard library that we're uh, building. Um, it's still work in progress, but our goal is to include like basic cryptographic operations, like different hash functions, different uh, um, uh, signature schemes, and uh, so forth. Some you know common math operations, and also this is how we are planning to uh, planning to handle Ethereum built-ins. So, for example, I uh, talked about memory, and memory in Mind and VM is diff addressed differently than it is in EVM. The EVM memory is byte addressable, and you always uh, kind of like have three to by chunks. So we will have a built-in that supports, for example, you know, uh, is in the standard library that allows you to interpret memory in the same way as EVM does. So a few more about this Merkleized AppSec syntax tree. So this is one of the unique features where uh, Maiden VM is not like a Harvard or, um, or Van Neumann architecture. You have this uh, Merkleized AppSec syntax tree that gets fed into the VM. It, it traverses this tree to in execute the program. Um, and there are key pro some, a few properties that we want to achieve with this Merkle abs abstract syntax tree is uh, uh, all programs can be reduced to a single hash, uh, and this is the root of the a must. And then uh, every internal node is actually a, a, a must root for every, like a smaller sub-program, so you can think about programs as being built into this, like smaller programs being aggregated to one large program. And then uh, leaves in this Merkle tree uh, are uh, kind of just linear sequences of instructions without um, uh, any control flow in them. And just to make this a little bit more concrete here is like a very quick example. So let's say this is a, some kind of assembly code where you have some sequence of instructions, then you have like an if-else if statement, and then you have some sequence of instructions at the end. And uh, a mask uh, for this program would look something like this, where you have, I don't know if I, you can see the pointer, yeah. Um, you have basically, um, you know, all the uh, blocks that are just linear without any control flow as leaves. And then the split block, for example, is the way we handle if-else statement. So a split basically means we execute either left or a right branch. And a join block means that you execute first the left branch and then the right branch. So this way you kind of start at the root and then you execute one block after the other, uh, kind of depth first search uh, uh, type of uh, traversal of the tree. And then you kind of, by the time you've traversed the entire tree, you've executed the full program. I guess one of the questions is why do we want to bother with MAST in the first place? Uh, why don't we use like a traditional Harvard or one neumann arch architecture? And there are a few reasons for this. The, the first one is efficiency. So in a context of uh, virtual machines, uh, or ZK virtual machines specifically, the way frequently we provide uh, programs to the VM is um, by providing just a hash of the program. And then inside the VM, it kind of expands the hash or unhashes it into the actual program and then executes that program. Uh, and frequently you need to kind of hash the entire program. In this case, what we can do is we only hash, like whenever you prove execution of a program, you only need to unhash just the branches that were taken. So if you have a large smart contract um, and you want to um, execute just like one function or uh, prove that you've executed a single function within that smart contract, you just need to unhash that branch that gets, and gets executed. And uh, you know, that depending on like the code uh, there, it could be quite more efficient than unhashing the entire program. Um, there is also a safety aspect to it where because of the structure, like it, by design you cannot have self-modifying code and you cannot have dynamic jumps. Like every call target is statically known because uh, every function call is basically it's done by, you, you do it like not call to a reference, but you do it, uh, 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 you invoke a, har a function by providing a hash of that function. Uh, so like you always know what exactly the code that you're going to be executing statically. 
And then there is a privacy aspect to it as well, where um, you can, in this Merkle tree, you can selectively reveal some leaves uh, of the program while keeping other leaves pro uh, private. So for example, uh, one of the things that you can, you can do, you can hide what happens in the middle, but you can have the public and pre and post conditions. So in the context of smart contracts, for example, you can prove that no new assets were created or destroyed while this was executed, but you will not actually specify how the assets were distributed while the program was executed in the middle. And then to wrap up, uh, just to give a few things about the status. So we're very actively working on the VM right now. So V01 was released with like the basic features back in November. Uh, we're almost done with V02 release, which will um, you know, provide this random access memory, 32-bit uh, integer operations and procedures. And then uh, you know, by uh, hopefully uh, like before the end of summer, we'll have uh, enough of like, we'll have cross-contract calls and storage and uh, you know, also uh, ambitiously, maybe we'll have exception handling, like uh, handling reverts and things like that. And uh, at that point, the VM will be powerful enough to like, actually start building a roll-up around it. So this is my talk. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, any questions from the audience? Yep, there's one on the, on the back. Oh, the box is here. You have to throw the box. <laughs> uh, two questions, if you don't mind. Um, so you mentioned compiling from higher level language to the Maiden VM, but did you consider compiling, um, tr transpiling EVM bytecode directly to Maiden VM and doing some off-chain static analysis to make the thing efficient? It's, it's possible, but I'm not sure if it will be as efficient as taking Solidity, because at the EVM level, you lose a lot of information. Uh, you lose the type, like, you know, at Solidity level, you know that, for example, you don't need the full 32 bytes. You can have a smaller data type. Um, you also, at Solidity level, you know you have this pointer information that uh, at the EVM level, it's all like whole data copy and all of that stuff that may not need it to be done. So it is doable, and it might be a simpler way, but I think it will be much less efficient. I think the, the uh, route that we're thinking about now is going through Yule, so we will take Yule representation and transpile it uh, to Maiden assembly. But even that is like I have some questions about whether Yule does not retain enough information from Solidity to like make it the most efficient way to compile. So um, there might be a, a kind of like a, it's definitely doable. I'm not sure it's going to be efficient. Gotcha. And the, the mast, I really like that. Um, it reminded me a lot of static single assignment, which is also a graph way of representing programs. But it's a graph and not a tree. And that's because you can have recursive functions. Is that something that will be supported? So um, there is a way to do recursion here. So in the first level, we will not have recursive functions because of the structure, but there is a way to do recursion. It's, a, it's quite a bit more complicated to do recursion in this way. So at least initially, we will not have support for recursion. OK, uh, we've got time for more questions. Yes. Here, here, on the oh, left. Thank you. Uh, so how deep is, uh, is must? How many levels uh, is the tree and you're, uh, I mean, uh, planning to support? I mean, it, it's unlimited practically. You can go as much, as deep as you need to. Like, there is no real limitation of how deep it can go. Um, I mean, it will need to be as deep, like you, uh, when you execute a program, it's like how far, like every if statement. So if you have a nested if statement or a loop nested inside an if statement, that's another level in, in the mast, right? Um, but, you know, it can go fairly deeply. I don't know, we've, if we've implemented fairly complex things in Maiden Assembly so far, and there has not been an issue. And I don't think, like thinking about it, I don't think the depth will be an issue at, at any point, just because you kind of, when you execute the program, it builds this, uh, the, the path that gets traversed. And it's, uh, in that case, you don't build a full mass. You don't, you don't ever build a full tree unless, you know, your program, well, you would actually would never build a full tree. You just build the branches that get executed. Um, so, and if your program is such where you only have one branch, it's just one linear sequence of instructions. So that's fairly easy must of one le uh, level. So, yeah, I don't, there is no limit. Anyone else? Um, okay, if not, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bobin. It was a really wonderful presentation. Thank you.